So in this video, we're going to take a look at this function g of x right here. Uh, the fact that g of x includes these absolute values is going to make this problem a little trickier than if the problem didn't have them. Uh, what we're going to be trying to do for this function is we're going to try to figure out where we have horizontal asymptotes. Uh, and then we're also going to be trying to see if the asymptote is located on both edges of the graph. So if we are looking for horizontal asymptotes, we need to figure out what's happening way over on the right edge of the graph as x approaches infinity. And if we're checking out both edges of the graph, we're going to have to figure out what's going on as x approaches negative infinity way over on the left edge. So we'll talk about this positive infinity limit first. So when I'm checking the limit as I approach positive infinity, you'll notice right here I drop the absolute values. And it should make a lot of sense as to why it's legitimate to do that at this point within the problem. X is approaching infinity. I am not going to be having any negative values near infinity. They're all going to be positive. So what do the absolute values do to positive numbers? The absolute values do nothing to positive numbers, which is why it's okay to drop them when I'm checking the limit as I approach infinity. So once again, approaching infinity, you're only considering positive values. The absolute values do not do anything to positive numbers. Therefore, it's okay to drop them within this line that I'm working across right now. Now, when I put infinity in place of these x's, I do get infinity over infinity. That's an indeterminate form. Signals, hey, do something that allows you to eventually get something to cancel. Uh, or use L'Hopital's rule if that's something you've already learned. And then reevaluate the limit once something's changed. So what I did is, is I, I can't do this, right? It's tempting to cancel the x's. I can't do that because I violate the order of operations. We've got parentheses around the top. We've got parentheses around the bottom of this fraction. Even though they're not shown, if you were going to graph this on a graphing calculator successfully, you'd have to get those parentheses around the numerator and the denominator. And I can't reach into that, those sets of parentheses to do the cancellation that I just suggested. So what I can do is if I have the numerator and denominator expressed as multiplication, I can cancel common factors that are shared between the two parts of the fraction. And this is definitely weird to do, but hopefully it'll be something that's pretty easy to understand once we discuss it. If I want to write this as multiplication, the numerator of this fraction, and also the denominator of this fraction, write it as multiplication, my hope in doing this is that I can cancel x's. Because if I can cancel x's, I'm going to have fewer x's to put infinity in place of, and I'm less likely to get this indeterminate form issue that we talked about a few seconds ago. So if I factor x from the numerator, removing an x from 3x is going to leave you with a 3. And that's something you've probably done a decent amount. Removing x from 2 is not something that's that comfortable to do. But when you're factoring something out of a quantity, you're needing to divide what you begin with by what you're factoring out because factoring out is essentially like undistributing. Now ignore what's in green here, but if you distribute this x back into this set of parentheses, see how I'm going to get 3x as the first term in the numerator, and then if I distribute this x into this, 2 times x divided by x, the x's cancel, and I'm just left with 2. I don't know why I changed the sign inadvertently there. That should still be uh, addition. Let me go ahead and fix that real fast. This should still be addition. That should still be addition. It's not going to affect the answer, and, and you'll see why in a few seconds. But I'm going to go through a similar process within the denominator. So in the denominator, what we want to do is we want to factor an x from these two terms. So we're moving an x from x is going to leave us with a 1. And then just like we said about the 2 in the numerator, I'm going to have to divide this 1 by what I'm factoring out in order to have my distribution, x gets distributed into this set of parentheses, I do get back to what I started with right here. So the benefit to this line, and you see it in green already here, once this is multiplication, I can cancel those common factors of x. Once I cancel those common factors of x, I can put infinity in place of the x's that remain. If I have a number divided by infinity, that fractional value is going to tend to 0. I have a number divided by infinity here as well, and that's also going to tend towards 0. So the reason why it didn't matter that I accidentally changed my sign from 
addition, which it was supposed to be, to subtraction, which I just fixed a few seconds ago, is because adding zero is the same as subtracting zero. So either way, I'm going to get three divided by one here, or a limit of three. So what the work in red here s suggests is that as we approach infinity, our function value approaches three, and therefore y equals three is an asymptote on the right edge of this graph. The reason why it's only on the right edge of the graph is because that is only the answer as we approach positive infinity. Now we wanted to analyze both edges of the graph. So we said a little bit earlier in the video, we're also gonna have to approach negative infinity with x. Now this is gonna be a little different, maybe a little tougher to understand initially. Eventually it's gonna finish in a similar way, but check out this fraction right here. If I'm approaching negative infinity, I am putting a negative in place of this x. The absolute values change the sign of that negative into a positive. What I've chosen to do is drop the absolute values. When I put a negative in place of this x, my negative that I've added right here is what changes the sign of that initial term in the denominator from a negative to a positive. So, so think about a few values. You should be able to confirm that what I've done is allowable as long as I'm only considering negative values going in for x. Pick a value like negative 5. Absolute value of negative 5 is positive 5. 5 minus 1 gives me 4. Put negative 5 here. Negative negative 5 is positive 5. Positive 5 minus 1 is 4. As long as what I'm putting in for the x is negative, this denominator that I have written within this blue fraction here has the same value as the original denominator does. So I can't drop the absolute values and hang this negative out here unless I'm confident that a negative is going in place of x. But if I'm approaching negative infinity, a negative is for sure going in place of x. So hopefully that makes decent sense. What I want to do now is the same sort of thing as I did up in the, the limit that we did in red across the top of the screen here. I'm putting negative infinity, right? Not infinity this time around, but negative infinity in place of that x. I get negative infinity in the numerator. I put negative infinity in place of this x, and there's the negative negative turning into a positive. This is an indeterminate form, even though we have a negative infinity divided by a positive infinity. And so like we argued about that indeterminate form a few minutes ago, do some algebra, get something to cancel. You'll see I did the same exact algebra within this fraction as I did within this fraction earlier in this discussion. One change is when I factor x from negative x, I'm left with a negative one in this position as opposed to the positive one we were left with in the earlier calculation. I still, once it's written as multiplication, am able to do that cancellation. If I put negative infinity in place of the x's that remain, once again, a number divided by infinity is zero, even if the infinity is negative, right? Two divided by negative a billion is still a fractional value that's really, really close to zero. So these fractional values still tend towards zero, which leaves me with a three in the numerator, a negative one in the denominator, and that of course is equal to negative three. And so what the work in blue implies is that as we go to the left edge of the graph, as x approaches negative infinity, our function value approaches negative three, and therefore y equals negative three is a horizontal asymptote on the left edge of the graph. And just to kind of confirm all our work here, I did produce a quick graph of this on the Desmos website. So if I look way over here on the right edge of the graph, my y value is leveling off. If you look at the scaling, my y value is leveling off at the y value of three. And as I come way over here to the left edge of the graph, my y value is leveling off at the y value of negative three. So it's kind of weird to have a situation where you you don't have the same horizontal asymptote on each edge of the graph. That's typically going to happen when you have an absolute value floating around somewhere within your function.